So I've been thinking this week about doing this once a, once a month on a continuing basis. So, and then we also paralleled that with the idea that God disappears in the Old Testament. He, he bows out as the stories progress, and that seems to be a, an emergent property of the sequencing of the stories, right? Because all the books were written by independent people, uh, different people, and then they were aggregated by other people. And so the narrative continuity is some kind of emergent property that's, that's a consequence of this interaction between people, readers and, and writers over centuries. And it's, it's strange that given that there are also multiple coherent narratives that unite it, you know, it's really, it's really not that easy to understand that, but it does at least seem to be the case. And so, and the third thing we talked about was that as God bows out, so to speak, the, 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 the individual personality seems of the, of the characters that are involved, the human characters that are involved, seems to become more and more developed. And it isn't exactly clear what that, I mean, what it means is that God steps away and man steps forward. That's what it means. But why it's arranged like that, or the, or the say, ultimate significance of that is by no means clear. And so, so Abraham, quite a well-developed character. Uh, and I would say there are two, there are multiple... Beyond the accounts of divine commands that Abraham carries out, this is from Friedman, the man I mentioned in the last lecture, who wrote The Disappearance of God and a variety of other books uh, that are well worth reading. The narrative also includes a variety of stories in which Abraham acts on his own initiative. He divides land with his nephew Lot, he battles kings, he takes concubines, he argues with his wife Sarah. On two occasions he tells kings that Sarah is his sister out of fear that they will kill him to get his wife. He arranges his son's marriage. In the place of the single story of Noah's drunkenness, there are, in the case of Abraham, the stories of a man's life. And one of the things I was really struck by reading this in depth and reading the commentary is how much like a story about a person it is. You know, Abraham isn't a divine figure in, in, any, in, in any archetypal sense, precisely. I mean, he has archetypal elements because he's also obviously the founder of a nation. But fundamentally, he's a human being. And... And he makes, he has the adventures and he makes the mistakes of a human being. And that's, it's the mistake part that really struck me, you know, because it, 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 I was talking with a friend of mine this week, Norman Deutsch, uh, who's a very remarkable person in many ways. And he was taking me to task. He was reading my book, which I'm going to publish, which will be out in January. And in, in the book, I, I, in one section, I contrasted the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament and made the case sort of based on Northrop Fry's ideas that the God of the Old Testament was really harsh and judgmental, you know, and that the God of the New Testament was more merciful and, you know, at least to some degree more sweetness and light. And Norman took me to task about that, saying that that was a, an overly Christianized interpretation, which would make sense because I derived it in part from Northrop Fry. And I really have come to understand that more, that, that he's right, because that he's right about that, because the God in the Old Testament is actually far more merciful than he's generally made out to be. And you really see this with, it's good news fundamentally if you regard the representation of God as somehow key to the description of being itself. I mean, Abraham makes a lot of mistakes, you know, serious mistakes, and, and yet he has a life and he's, and he's blessed by God despite the fact that he's pretty deeply flawed and engages in deceptive practice. I mean, he's a good man, but he's not a perfect man by any stretch of the imagination. And, and things work out really well for him, and he's the founder of a nation and all of that. And that's good news for everyone, because perfect people are very, very hard to find. And if the, 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 the only pathway to having a rich and meaningful life was through perfection, then we would all be in deep trouble. And so that, that's very satisfying to read that. And, um, the, the, other, the other thing that I've been struck by is that, you know, Abraham, and I think this is actually absolutely key to the in, in interpretation of the story, Abraham goes out and does things. That's the thing. And so one of the things that I've noticed in my life is that nothing I've ever done was wasted. And by done, I mean put my heart and soul into, you know, like, like attempted with, with all of my effort. That, that always worked. Now, it didn't always work the way I expected it to work. That's a whole different issue. But the payoff from it was always positive. I always, something, always, something of value always accrued to me when I made the sacrifices necessary to do something worthwhile.
And so I think part of the message in, in, this, in, this story of a, in the Abrahamic stories is go do something. And, and I've, I've, I've thought about this in a variety of ways outside of the interpretation of this story because I have this program some of you might be familiar with which is called the Future Authoring Program and it's, it's designed to help people make a plan for three to five years into the future, you know, and we, so what you do is you, you answer some questions, it's a writing program, you answer some questions about how you would like your life to be, what you would like your character to be, three to five years down the road, if you were taking care of yourself like you were taking care of someone that you actually cared about. So you kind of have to split yourself into two people and treat yourself like you like someone you have respect for and that you want the best for. And that's not easy because people don't necessarily have respect for themselves and they don't necessarily want what's the best for themselves because they, they have a lot of self-contempt and a lot of self-hatred, a lot of guilt and a lot of existential angst and, and a lot of self-consciousness and all of that. And, and so people don't necessarily take care of themselves very well. And, and I, think it's, I, think it's, I think you have an obligation it's one of the highest moral obligations to treat yourself as if you're a creature of value. And, and that is in some sense, it's in some sense that's independent of your actions. And you, you might think about that metaphorically as a recognition of your divine worth in the biblical sense, regardless of your, of your sins, so to speak. And I think that's, that's, that's powerful language as far as I'm concerned once you understand it. Anyways, with the self-authoring program, the future authoring program, you, you, ask, you answer questions about what, what, how you would like your friendships to be conducted. Because it's useful to surround yourself with people who are trying to move forward and, and more importantly, who are happy when you move forward and not happy when you move back, backwards. Not when you fall, that isn't what I mean, but when you're doing self-destructive things, your friends shouldn't be there to cheer you on. Because then they're really not acting like friends, obviously, you know. I know it's obvious, but it still happens all the time and people allow it to happen. It's not a good idea. And you know, How would you like to sort your family out. And I was thinking about this this week too, because I was thinking about Noah's Ark, and there was a phrase in that story that I didn't understand, which was that Noah was perfect in his generations. I thought, I don't know what that means. And you know, when you're, when you're going through a book like the Bible, if you don't understand a phrase, that actually means you've missed something. It doesn't mean that that's just not, you know, that's not germane to the story. It means you're stupid. You didn't get it, man. You didn't get it. You didn't understand it. And so, the, the idea that Noah was perfect in his generations and that's why he could build an ark that would sustain him and him and, and humanity itself through the flood. It meant that he, not only did he walk with God, which is something that we talked about in, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, but that he established proper relationships with his family, with his children. And so what that meant was that his, not only was he well integrated as a person, but his level of integration had reached the point where it stretched out beyond him and encompassed his family. And so it was Noah and the family that was in the ark. And I can tell you, and I really understood this this year because I had a very tumultuous year. You could think about it from a personal perspective. I could think about it as a year that had no shortage of floods. And, my, and part of the reason that I was able to get through it, I also had terrible health problems. And the only, the, one of the reasons I was able to get through it was because my family really came together around me, my kids, my wife, my parents, and, and, and my friends as well. And particularly a certain group of friends and that's partly all of that came together in my mind this week and I thought well that's what it means to be perfect in his generations meant that he hadn't just straightened himself out he'd also straightened out his relationships with his family and I can tell you that when crisis strikes you which it will it will the flood will come right that's why the apocalypse is always upon us the flood will definitely come in your life and to the degree that you've organized yourself psychologically and also healed the relationships between you and your family that could be the critical element that that determines whether you live or die when a crisis comes or or whether someone in your family lives or dies and so the idea of the the ark containing the man who's who walks with god and whose generations are perfect and that that's what sustains humanity through the crisis it's like you couldn't be more psychologically accurate than that you know and the other thing i was thinking about this week i I was thinking about another line in the New Testament. 